everyone. Um, thank you to the hosts for the great introduction. So you all know my name now. I'm Drishti Jain. And today's talk is going to be very exciting. All of us are Go developers. Maybe even some of us are just uh, have started using Go or are still learning Go. So the best way to explore a language, in my personal opinion, is to develop something that is fun, that is cool. It need not be something that you want to say, take it to an enterprise level. But it's a good start through game development that you can understand the language, the power of Go very well. So today I'm going to talk about all about game development. I'll be showing you a, a sample as well of a game that I developed and how you can also follow along or try it out later on as well. So to tell you a little about myself, I'm a computer engineer. I'm a full-time software developer. Uh, I'm also a tech geek. I love to read about new technology, try out new technology. I'm a social entrepreneur. That is what I do uh, as a part of my nonprofit organization back in India. And I'm an international tech speaker, so I like to share my knowledge about tech with the community around me. And that's my Twitter handle as well, so you can follow me there. Um, and skill up with Drishti. So people who are not currently into tech, but are looking to transitioning into tech and would like some, say, guidance or how do they approach this um, great world of tech? How do they be a part of it? Maybe take it up as a full-time job, switch careers, or if somebody who's already into tech, what is it that they can do in order to grow more, succeed more? So you can just scan the QR code. That will take you to my website, and you'll find my calendar there. So feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one session with me as well. So now all about game development. We as kids have learned most of the very first things in our life through games, be it about b being a good team player, when we played, say, Snake and Ladders, or Ludo, or Monopoly, or even understanding how to interact with other folks around us, right from the time we were little kids, little babies. So now as developers, we have the magic, we know the magic of coding. So why not use that and try and build a game for ourselves? Before we jump directly into everything about games, um, there are four key concepts that you should remember whenever you are looking at developing a game. The very first one being collision detection. In any kind of game, there, if you're creating a multiplayer game or a single uh, player game as well. So what should happen in case two objects, two components of your game interact with each other? That is, a, that is like an edge case that you have to handle. The second one being rendering. Be it your text rendering, your image rendering, you should have a powerful way of doing it so that your end user has a seamless and a smooth experience when using your game. The third one being game loops. We know how to avoid infinite loops in our core software development, our backend development. With games, this goes to another level. We don't want our game to just keep on going into a loop and it does not reach any particular place. We do not want that. So it is important to avoid having any kind of loops. And the most important of all, don't forget about the physics. <laughs> don't have a tree wherein if the apple falls, it's flying up in the air. It is very anti-intuitive. It's anti-physics. So basic things about basic physics, that's all. So that anybody who's using it, the time, the gulf of e evolution that we say, in order to execute it, should be very less. If you give the user your game, they should be able to understand it on, your, on their own instead of a lot of instructions. Now coming to the main core part of what comprises of a good game. So any game, like in software development, we have the MVC architecture pattern, which if we use, it makes our applications more uh, scalable, more maintainable. And also it makes it more flexible to add in any kind of new features that we have. In a similar way, the ECS concept, uh, Entity Component System Architecture, is very useful when doing game development. So having your game divided into entities, components, and the system that interacts with it helps achieve this goal. Using uh, the ECS architecture in games, one is able to achieve a very lean design of the game. With ECS, we are able to achieve decoupling, encapsulation, modularization. And since we are using different um, components for different uh, entities and having the interaction separately defined, it also helps it being very, very flexible. Now, why is flexibility important? Say you developed a game which um, 
Something like Mario, wherein there are different worlds. You are interacting with different objects. And say you are in, trying to integrate it with some other component as well. Say in your particular version of Mario, you also have um, aliens come in. So alien would be a separate component. Your current game should be flexible enough so that you don't have to modify the whole game. You don't have to rewrite code for it. You can just code for alien and integrate it very well with your current Mario game. So making use of ECS while developing games is one of the best practices. Also, it makes our lives as game developers to be very easy. To give you an idea of what ECS and how do they interact with, so entities are composed from components of data. And uh, these are which the systems operate within the entity's components. So, any comp so there are different entities inside components, and system interacts with it based on different features that you have. Now, this is the um, way it is defined in Unity. But the similar concept applies even when we are developing games in Go, because the core ECS architecture remains the same. Now, in Go, how do we achieve ECS? So there is the open source um, library called Donbury. This is for the Ebiton engine, and this helps us achieve uh, ECS in our Go games uh, directly. So to show you how does it actually work, we understood what the concept is, but how does it translate to code? Where do I exactly see the E, C, and S, and to show the interaction between them? So um, you would import Donbri, and then um, we will now be creating different entities out of it. So Donbri.newworld helps us achieve a unique ID for each entity. And any entity that we are creating can be created either with create or create many, depending upon if we are creating a single component or it is related to multiple components. Now, in this example, what I'm trying to do is it's a simple basic object which has an x and y coordinate in the space of the game. So to define the structure, the struct for it, I have two um, parts to it, x and y, and they are of type float. So I would define it simply like this. And then my coordinate is the component. I have to give this component the data that is there. So I would do it like this. And I would effectively create. So we looked uh, in a couple of si slides ago that uh, we have create and create many. So here, position data or coordinate data is depending upon what I'm defining it to be. It is the x, y coordinate. And also, you can set values. Now, whenever you have a component, say, imagine that there's a point in your game. It has an x and y coordinate. Now, what are the uh, intuitive things that come to us? We can set some value. So that would effectively move it. Or we would want to um, modify the value using some logic of our game, not, say, hard code it. So if we have to set the value, we would use set value and set the value that uh, the coordinate should get. To, we would also want to get the value. Say, in our game, we have different levels. Through one level, the data should be stored, and we should be able to fetch the data in order to pass it to the next level. So that is what will be achieved by get. And we have modify. So it is simple, like um, if you want it to increment by 10, um, say it's moving, the x coordinate is only moving, the y coordinate isn't moving. So accordingly, you would modify that. Now let's look at this in a complex component. The earlier example was about the very basic block. So in my presentation, I have three core parts. The first part is done wherein we saw how do we actually develop a component and in the most raw form. Now, I'm adding another dimension to it. And after this, we'll be looking at building a full-fledged game that you all can try as well. So uh, consider a simple component. We have x and y. x and y represent the coordinates of the component. And vx, vy are the uh, for the velocity uh, to represent the velocity vector. Now, in this, uh, I would create it using my coordinate as well as velocity. So I would define coordinate and velocity in the similar way I defined earlier for the raw component. And I would create an entity out of it. And uh, whenever I have to add a new complex component, so there are many things that can be done. Say I have a player. That player has a particular coordinate. That player has a particular velocity. 
And in each and every thing, I would want to work along my x, y. I would want to set it. I would want to remove an entity. Say it is something like an asteroid collision game, wherein we have um, some kind of a firing component. It is hitting those um, asteroids or debris in space. So when it hits, so when those two coordinates match, I would have an if condition of when these x and y coordinates became, become the same, and I would remove the asteroid component. But I would still leave my like the hit part to be there. So in that case, remove is very useful. So till now, I hope you are able to see that it is just you are only limited by the imagination that you keep in your game. Um, Go provides us very useful, very easy way in order to create games. Now, two additional concepts, one being tile maps. So tile maps is a great way of having, if you have a, if you're planning to have a multi-level game, wherein different uh, levels would have, say, different scenarios. For example, one could be a volcanic setting, one could be a beach setting, one could be a mountain setting. So uh, you can imagine, like, the graphics would be completely different. So in game development, the best practice in order to manage these is using tile maps. So what tile maps helps us is, so your whole screen would be uh, logically divided into different tiles of the same size. And for each of, these si uh, of each of these tiles, you would have a logic based on the RGB values. That way it is easy for you to also manipulate any time that you want to modify it. The another one which is many a times ignored and uh, is actually the core part of a game being successful. Say if you go ahead and publish it as well, of more users using it and you actually monetizing it, is about level design. So what does level design mean? Level design is literally the design of different levels in your game. It should be a logical sequence of different levels that a person would go through. Now, level design, you can consider it to be, say, if you're in your level one, you're able to qualify uh, the level. Say, um, it is an asteroid hitting game, you have some kind of a background, uh, be it a mountain background, you're able, to, you're able to destroy the asteroids. Now, what is the next level? You should be able to retain your score and then move to a logical uh, next level, say, the volcanic eruption. So once the mountain part is done, then you would go to the volcano and then maybe to sky and then maybe to space. So there's a logical incrementation even in the creative aspect of building your game. So that, okay. So it would be a logical um, incrementation of the levels that you're creating in your game. To put it simply, you want to have your levels such that they are very, very engaging. Engagement is the core part of whenever you're building a game. Have you ever played a game that had a lot of hype around and it was just launched, but then you realized it isn't that engaging? In the real world, the core thing that makes a product or a game for that matter to be most usable by users across the world and to have that retention rate is how engaging a product is. The similar logic is applied in a game. A game does not have to be very difficult to qualify, but it has to be engaging. Taking a common example of, say, Candy Crush. Candy Crush is something that is very simple. It does not uh, require somebody to have a very um, great knowledge about, say, using a mobile phone. But it is very engaging. And it also has a demogra uh, it also caters to all demographies. So whether it's a kid, um, a teenager, uh, or uh, somebody who's older in age as well. So it is something that is easily explainable to everybody. So keeping it engaging is the core part of it. Now we've seen how do we build a component, how do we build a complex component. Now coming to Go and using more power of Go. There are two open source libraries that make use, um, that help us make games in Go. The very first one being uh, Ebit Engine. So this is uh, the library that is most often used, and you'll also find a good community around it because of the number of developers who are using this. As it says on the documentation, it is a dead simple 2D library for Go. If you're building a 2D game, which does not involve a 3D aspect to it, Ebit Engine is the best way to uh, go about it. This could be, say, an example of, say, the 2048 game that uh, was very popular right now, 
or a wordle, for example, which was very popular. So anything that is 2D, this is the library to go. Now the benefit of Ebit Engine and what makes it so popular is that it is multi-platform, uh, it supports multi-platform deployment. That way you don't have to worry about if you are building only for mobile, only for the desktop. It helps you deploy it in um, uh, all platforms. Also, it supports automatic, um, also it supports automatic texture atlas. So what, what does this mean? So uh, suppose, let's look at this image as well. So suppose you have a picture of the gopher like this. You have uh, the front view, the side view. Now in your game, you would maybe at different instances want it to be different. So what Ebiton, Ebiton is the former name of Ebit Engine, does is it helps with automatic texture atlas. Now what this does it, it takes away the complexity of making a texture atlas from the developer directly. It is already there in the library and it will take care of it automatically. So you don't have to worry about this. And your focus is going to mainly be on building a good level design and making it more creative, more engaging. Because that is the human aspect of building a game. That is something that nobody can take away from us. And let's use the powerful features of different libraries. The second one is Pixel. So Pixel is another open source, very famous um, library for game development in Go. It is a handcrafted 2D game library in Go. Um, this is where you can find the documentation. Uh, this is the GitHub page of the open source project. And the benefit with Pixel is that it is integrated with the standard library of Golang. Now what benefit this gives us is that you're able to load pictures directly using the image package. So say you want to try some game element in your existing code just um, to try and see if you want to have that feature in your current application as well. In that case, over Ebit Engine, Pixel would be your go-to choice. And it also um, helps with uh, Potter Duff composition. So enhancing your 2D lighting, cutting holes between images. So it's all about your creativity and the use case that you want. So Pixel is very useful in that scenario. Now that we have seen different um, libraries, we have seen how do we build a complex component as well. Now let's look at building a game. Now a game can have many applications. Um, so, Say building game doesn't just mean that you would be competing to get something, but a game could also have a different use case. Say, uh, I'm taking a very different use case in this scenario. Say I have an image like this, but I want my game to be able to focus on what I want it to focus on. Say I want to focus here. I don't want to focus on trees. So what would my game look like in this case? You can consider this to be something like a zoom feature. This is a part of a bigger game wherein you would want to interact with something. Um, before I go into code, let me just show you what would my initial and what would my after picture look like. So, say, um, the one on the left, so this is an image um, of a famous uh, Indian savory chart dish called alu tikki. But this also has the curd, which is to be added on top. But in my game, I want to focus only on the alu tiki. So how would I do that? That is what we'll code. So the end result would look something like this, wherein the focus is just there. So in order to do that, uh, in this case, um, you can either have your image in a separate path. So the image would be any image that you want. Or for simplicity, you can also keep it to be in the same folder as your Go code. And you would, I'm using the Ebiton, li uh, Ebiton uh, library in Go. So you would import that. Then I'm uh, specifying the constant screen width uh, and the height that I want. So, so it's as simple as this to do. A key um, thing to consider is that when you are working with images, so in order to specify it, you have to have it in the image tag with, uh, so my image is by the name of image.png. So this is how you would import it so that uh, Ebit uh, Engine understands it much, much well. Now here comes the core part of what will help us achieve the exploring the image um, feature. Now 
A good example of the game that I'm building is, say, uh, how many of us have uh, seen in the newspaper, say, there are two images and you have to find five differences in uh, both the images? Has everybody seen that? Yeah? Great. So now, in that case, imagine that same, same game to be on your phone. So you would want to zoom and see. So you would want to explore the image. That is what this game is all about. So in order to identify that, you would want to explore the image more. And in order to do that, uh, the first thing is that you would be importing your image. So in your var, these would be two uh, important methods. Your count plus plus is going to store how much, how much are you zooming inside it. And if you are zooming in too much, or if you are like zooming out too much as well, if you're going outside the screen zone. Um, those are two basic edge cases that your code should be able to handle, and it should be able to catch it in the form of an error in order to avoid the game loops that I talked about in the second or third slide. Now this is, so my draw function to uh, keep it simple, and you can use this as a boilerplate code. You can have draw as anything else. Draw would be the place wherein your main core logic of your game would come in. So now when we are exploring the image, um, the main factor is going to be the zoom factor. So whenever you have your key pressed, imagine you are sitting on your computer and um, it is not a touch screen. So you want a way in order to have some logic implemented when a key is pressed. That is wherein Ableton has um, uh, is key pressed, and then you can identify if it was a key up, key down, and so on. If we are trying to go on the, uh, we are trying to zooming in what direction. And I would have my zoom, zoom factor to be incremented in that case. Now, what this helps us do is, say when we are finding five differences in images, we would want to actually see if a particular character is wearing sunglasses or not. So we would want to explore that more. Or if we are trying to um, find some color difference and trying to just make sure if it is the right color difference or not. So that is what um, is my logic of adding zoom factor. And I'm incrementing it in point once so that I have more time in order to um, explore the image so that the person who's using the game is more engaged. Now the next uh, line that you'll see is uh, draw image options. So in that, that is what will be called in order to create the entity. And geom, geom.scale, this is an inbuilt functionality um, of Ebit engine. And you can use this directly in your code. So, there are different ways. Say if this was like a pinwheel game, wherein if somebody clicked up or down, you would have a pinwheel which would start rotating. Maybe it was directed towards kids who would want to see how it works. So in that case, there's also a geom.rotate uh, function that is there. So a lot of these functionalities are already there. You just have to know those in order to use it. So anytime you're working with Ebit Engine, I would encourage that instead of um, defining the logic again in your code for any particular function, the best way will be to just check in the documentation if that function is already defined. If it is already defined, then you can directly go ahead, use it in your code. Now, in our case, when we are building it for, say, find the differences, in this case, we would want to scale our um, image that is there based on the key that is pressed, whether it be up, down. So then, um, op.gom dot scale. And then I'm passing the two parameters. These are my defined, um, um, these are my defined factors. Say if I'm incrementing it, why is it zoom factor in both places? Because both my X and Y would increment by the same amount. If I had a separate logic of if my key is pressed up, my say, I would increment X, but I would double increment Y. So I would include one more um, variable. I would pass that as my second uh, parameter. But in my case, I have to um, zoom or explore the image in the same amount in both the directions. That's why it is a uh, zoom factor for both X and Y. And then I would draw image. So IMG, if you remember, is what I imported, uh, included my image in. So this is the core logic of exploring. If you see the problem, the game that we are trying to build or the problem we are trying to solve of uh, finding the five differences in images seems very complex. But when you use Ebit Engine and with the power of Go, you see it's very less number of lines. It is also um, 
something that makes it very, very scalable. Say you wanted to add some other feature. Maybe when you zoom in, you wanted the screen to have sparkles, or you wanted to have some audio, some sound, uh, which would encourage the player to, key, uh, to be engaged in your game. So you can add all of that as well. Now, this is how the main function uh, will look like. So image.png is the file that has the image that I want to work on. My layout will have the screen width and height. So that is the um, screen that I have defined in the very uh, top part of my go uh, code or in the previous slides. And um, also my image width and height, I would also define my image bounds. And in, since I'm um, kind of importing the image from file from my local machine, I'm using new image from file. There are multiple ways. If it is already there in some source code, if you're building a game which, say, uses your company-specific images, and it's already there in your GitHub repo, so you can accordingly modify the code in order to fetch the image directly from there. And as simple as that, you'll, uh, you can use different filters. Um, in my case, complex filters weren't required, since it was exploring images to find differences. And I would just use uh, ebitin.filter default. Now, different filters give you different uh, benefits. And finally, you would also want to handle error. So that is what happens in the end part of our code. So you see, it, it is very easy. If we even look at the number of slides like that has the snapshot of the code, it is like one, two, three, four. Yeah, so just four slides. So you see, developing a game is not that complex. And with Go, what this helps us do is to create games, use inbuilt functionalities, and just use a creativity in order to build. And also, I would encourage that you can actually go ahead, use uh, this boilerplate code. This is like a fine five things. You can expand upon it and build more on the top of it itself instead of completely writing something from scratch. That way, you would have built a game like this. And say you wanted to have the differences. So when I, I was zooming in, my final part looked like this. Say in this case, I wanted to find differences in the colors of the carrot beetroot strands on the top of the image that is there. Or if I wanted to identify different uh, colors that are there in the image. All of that is also possible. So um, this is the power of Go. This is the power of game development. So, Throughout this talk, we learned like how do we uh, create a component, move the component, create an actual game, and use this to just try out. And it can be like a side project for you as well that you try out so that you gain that confidence that you too can develop games and be a game developer. Here are the references uh, in my talk. So all of these are the open source libraries and their links. What you can do is there are also a ton of examples. And they are, uh, the code is also there. So if you want to try out something, you can take the boilerplate code from there, or even look at it and understand how does it work and how simple it is to code with Go. It's very few hundred lines of codes for each of the games, even the one that we built right now. So it is a great place to start, a great place to become a game developer. So yes, that's it from my end. Um, you can find me across socials. And I'll also be around in the conference, so happy to chat and uh, encourage, I would encourage everybody to become a game developer. And instead of just playing games, develop something and play your own game. Thank you.